Good evening, everyone, and particularly Prof Leach, Prof Zinn, Professor Pepita, Faculty of Health Sciences, staff, other deans, my friends, my family. Thank you for coming this evening. It's my pleasure to present to you this evening a lecture entitled The Interplay Between Universal and Unique Contexts in Shaping Child Developmental Assessment. At the outset, I would just like to pay tribute and credit and acknowledgement to the following references, people who've written works that I'll be using in my presentation this evening. They came into the world in as cliches in suitcases, talismans. They cherished as shields against poisonous madness. They saw no familiar hills and heard no familiar songs. Holding on to their fetishes, they defy time and distance. They surround themselves with jacarandas and pines, build concrete walls around their homes. I hope next time they will import snow, change the seasons to humor their eccentric whims. In this lecture, the revision of the Griffith Scales of Child Development, or Griffith III as it is known, will be described. It is not a description or a story that falls easily and smoothly into sequence. It is one that has been garnered from many sources and from many people. Some of it comes in the form of fragments from professional men and women who have looked upon developing children with a unique and unrelenting eye. It comes from men and women who carry the germ of knowledge implanted somewhere deeply in their beings, a place where a curious, natural rhythm exists and a kind of magic. Additionally, the lecture will end with suggested plans for the future or the what next phase in the interplay between universal and unique contexts in shaping child developmental assessment, specifically using the Griffiths Three. Dear Kailish, dear Elliot, this is me. My name is Elliot and I love to climb trees. My name is Kailash and I love to climb trees too. Same, same, but different. This is me. P.S. Do you live in a tree? That is my tree house where I play. I live in a red brick building with my mom, dad and baby sister. I live with my, mother, with my family too, all 23 of us. My mom, dad, sister, brother, grandmother, grandfather, aunties, uncles, cousins, and our animals. I have pets too, but not nearly as many as you. Same, same, but different. What does it look like where you live? A great river flows through my village. Peacocks dance under trees shaped like umbrellas. And the sun is giant and especially hot here. In my city, the sun hides behind buildings as tall as the sky. Taxis, buses and cars fill the street. Here, there are few cars and still too much traffic. Same, same, but different. I ride a bus to school with my friends. So do I. 
same, same, but different. This is our alphabet. This is our alphabet. This is how my friends and I say hello. This is how my friends and I say hello. Same, same, but different. We are best friends, even though we live in two different worlds. Or do we? Different, different, but the same. Pregnancy and birth reveal a baby's living architecture. And as this miracle of conception grows, a unique character begins to emerge with its own preference and perspective on the world. We know that children and babies are born with the most beautiful uninhibited flexibility. And because they have this uninhibited flexibility due to an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, it allows them to learn creatively and to play uninhibitedly and develop beautifully. Children learn about the world in much the same way that adults do, in fact. Child development has been described very aptly as a dynamic, moving target, and yet it is both universal and unique. Same, same, but different. We know children love to play, and it is this appetite for change and play that leads them to be very curious about the world around them. And in fact, this wonderful commodity of being able to play connects them to the real world, their real world. But play is also a science, and it is a very essential ingredient to child development, an optimal child development, because play, in fact, lights up the brain. And in playing, children make their own decisions, they become immersed in a moment, they have this intrinsic motivation to be spontaneous, so their play is not scripted. They become very imaginative, flexible, creative, adaptive, skilled. In fact, it even helps to advance their language development, makes them more successful at school, and in fact, even more emotionally secure. And of course, it is fun and enjoyable to be able to play. When we consider child development then, we also know that children thrive when they have the time and the space to breathe, to just hang out, get bored sometimes, relax, take risks, make mistakes, dream, and really just have fun, in fact, on their own terms, and maybe even fail. Now, in the past, we had the working child who toiled in the fields and then later in factories of the Industrial Revolution. The 20th century saw the rise of a free-range child, and more recently, we have experienced the emergence of the age of the managed child, with a helicopter parent hovering overhead, trying to control things. And today, more specifically, we face the challenge to find a new recipe for a child who's growing up in an information age. This makes this challenge to find a way to assess children and their development so challenging because we need to find a way to comprehensively investigate and understand a child's development in their motor, social and cognitive areas very specifically. We know that direct observation and testing and we have to get reports from caregivers or parents to get the true story. And why do we need this true story? Well, Children's development is such a rapid, shifting, changing, natural thing that it makes assessing them very challenging because there's a living, moving target in front of you. So of the various methods that we use for assessing children and particularly their development, the Griffith Scales or the Griffiths Three, which is the focus of my lecture this evening, are among those which have been accorded worldwide recognition because they are used by pediatricians and psychologists and other paraprofessionals in the use of assessing children. It, the, the Griffiths Three is such a valuable tool because it gives a thorough holistic diagnosis and a developmental profile of the child at hand. And through these periodic re-examinations, we can bring to light developmental trends and establish developmental baselines. 
we need developmental baselines because in having a developmental baseline, we all know where we are working from and where we are going to. In the past, developmental baselines formed important aspects of um, theorists that have created theories that we use so often these days. Ploy's regression periods, Vygotsky's zones of proximal development, Piaget, who suggests that cognitive development progresses as change happens in a child's knowledge system, and of course the child psychologist Ruth Griffiths, who created the Griffith Scales of Child Development. Dr. Ruth Florence Griffiths was born on the 2nd of September in 1895. She experienced an isolated and troubled childhood, something she seemed to remember forever after. Now, Dr. Brian Byrne recorded that it was perhaps these early experiences that laid the roots for her later meticulous observation of young children, her love for them, and her pleasure in observing their personalities unfold and blossom. She went on to develop the Griffith Scales of Child Development, which were in, in 1954 known as the Griffith Scales of Mental Development. She first of all knew that observing children in play was a very important thing. Because at that time, Spearman, whose idea of intelligence was focused very, very formally, um, had taken over the world. And her thoughts of observing, observing children in play was rather radical. But she published her measure in 1954 and decided purely to focus on children in the first two years of life. It was so well received by the community at, at that time that she went on to extend them to children up to the age of eight years in the 1960s. Then in 1994, Dr. Michael Huntley revised the scale, the first two babies' year scale, and that was received extremely well around the world. In 2006, Professor Dolores Lewis led a team that extended the scales, and in 2016, we released the Griffiths III. The Griffiths III and its kit, case, equipment, materials looks like this slide on the scale, on this, on this slide in front of you. But who actually did it? Well, in, in 2010, the Association for Research in Infant and Child Development, the ARICD, launched the actual revision of the scales. And this was done in conjunction with Hargreve the publishing company based in Germany, and a team from the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University at the time. The slide in front of you depicts out the role players who led and who have allowed the Griffiths tree to be in our world today. Many people on this particular slide are in the room this evening, and I wish to acknowledge each one of them for their hard work. In looking at why Ruth Griffith's view of child development was so amazing, her 1954 diagram of child development was rather radical because she brought social background and environmental factors into the mix and particularly acknowledged time and space as being an important commodity in children's development. What is interesting about this drawing in front of you is that it is two-dimensional. In 2016, we launched the scales with a new avenues of learning drawing, drawing or diagram. This is in front of you right now. As you can see, it is a very dynamic drawing. In fact, it is commonly and fondly called the washing machine because you can, it looks particularly like a washing machine. But the dynamic movement is what is important in this particular drawing in front of you. Because it still upholds Ruth Griffith's ideas of observing children, considering their social, emotional, and environmental factors, and not denying the fact that there are physiological processes at hand and which drive the child's development. So what kinds of things actually guided the revision of the scales? Well, first of all, knew we need to keep, had to keep the developmental domains and constructs in place that were relevant. 
we knew the Griffith scales were unique because they'd come a long way. They were child-friendly and they liked play. They were also very useful in cross-cultural assessment, which meant that we had to try and retain their global relevance. We also knew that the world with its fast-paced way of doing things would change the way in which we methodologically assess children. So we had to become cutting edge in terms of globalization, testing and standardization. We also knew very specifically that any measure only really works if it's got good test specifications. If you don't have a test specification to follow or to lead you, you're going to get lost. And we particularly knew that the scales were developmental in nature, and so we had to keep that in mind. There were six phases that drove the revision of the Griffith III, all the way from a diagnostic phase one to reviewing items, looking at designing items, piloting and standardizing it, taking it forward and releasing it, producing it and releasing it, and now we are currently in the stage of training people around the world to use the scales. So the purpose of this measure then is to understand and to measure general development. We kept the underlying premise of structured observation in place. The breadth of the scales was very important. We also knew that we needed to be able to use it in clinical work and research. And interestingly enough, we reduced the ceiling of the scales from eight years to five years, 11 months. Now this is an interesting slide because in 2016, the Griffiths then, we know, still looks at children in their lived world. We consider space, rhythm, and time. We have a physiological and neurological focus to them. There are five subscales. The individual, interpersonal, environmental spheres are important. But in 1954, which is many years ago, the child's lived world was still important when the Griffiths was designed and created. Space, rhythm, and time was still necessary and needed to be kept in place. There were six subscales, and the social background, environmental features of the child were very important. Same, same, but different. We also knew that in developing the five subscales, which are in front of you, they needed to be particularly underpinned by constructs that made sense. And this is our construct map that we drew and put together. Every single one of the subscales from A to E had a very particular subconstruct that underpinned them. When we designed this construct map, we had to find kinds of items that we would put in our measure that would make sense. And so every single subscales item was considered very carefully. Do we keep it? Do we change it? Do we replace it? Or do we throw it away? What do we do with it? And how we went about designing the kinds of items to be in the scale was that we actually considered and consulted many common, currently used children's games and toys. We considered children's viewpoints. We heard what they had to say and we watched how they played. And these are the kinds of items that eventually became the underpinning features of the scale. The big picture is one of the items on the language and communication subscale. The old picture, as you can see, was designed, interestingly, by considering our very own beachfront. So if you have a look very carefully, you can see the pier, and you can see the Hobie Beach wall. The new one doesn't have it anymore, but there are Griff the Bears in the picture, and there are children playing. And so the new picture had a very interesting introduction to it, and the items throughout the kit where Griff and Ruthie the bear became very featuring within our um, kit. So we had to put this test to the test, okay? And so we had to pilot our experimental version first before we could launch a real version, one that would work. At the outset, we had 429 items, and we had two separate administrations. The first round, we, as subscale leaders, Test, each tested 10 children in both South Africa and the UK to see if what we were at least trying to work with was working. Then in round two, we had some testers, in fact 20 from our own university who sampled 100 children on the measure. Eventually, by looking at feedback from test administrators, 
considering the item difficulty, the statistics that went with it, and the input from subscale leaders, we were able to come up with a measure in which we could use in the UK to test 426 children from the United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland to actually get the measure sorted out. We had 208 girls and 218 boys in our um, sample. The, the um, final version of the measure came out very reliably in terms of its reliability coefficients, with 0.8 and 0.484 being our indicators. There was very robust constructability too to the measure. And in the future, we are needing to do test and retest reliability studies, factorial validity studies, and try and correlate this with other similar tests to enhance our reliability and validity statistics. This is what we are currently underway doing. The revision of the Griffiths tree can be likened to a railway system that begins with a single main route that forks into a number of distinct lines. And although these lines initially continue in the same direction as the main route, each junction brings forth a greater chance of divergence. Some of the tracks eventually lead to distant lands and some run parallel to the main route. This particular slide is very apt and very appropriate to the Griffith scales because there is an interplay between that which is universal and that which is unique, as I have just described. But let's apply it because it's only in the application, it's only in the eating of the pudding that you really know that there is a pudding. So the first case is that of Sefiso. Here's a little boy who was three years and four months and 26 days at the time of assessment. He was assessed on the 13th of July this year. Some background information to Sofiso is that his mother had a very difficult start to her pregnancy. She had a threatened abortion at six weeks and spent the rest of her pregnancy up until seven, eight months on bed rest. Eventually he was born a term and it was a very successful birth and there were no concerns. However, his language development was delayed, yet all his other milestones, walking, crawling, sitting, were reached on time. The Griffith Scales provides you with a developmental profile, and this is an example of what we use to interpret the test results. The red line is the average line, or the line which would indicate normal development. And as you can see, across the subscales, as well as the general development bar, which is the last one in the histogram, you can see that Sofiso isn't on par. And there are certain areas where he's poorer than others. So the conclusion was that he's actually functioning one year and five months below his chronological age, and extremely low in comparison to the children of his own age. Their consistency across the four subscales, A, B, C, and D, and subscale E, which is his gross motor, was his relative strength. So the recommendation in this case was that he would experience challenge in a formal school environment and would do well if referred to a pediatric neuro neurologist, a pediatrician, and a psychologist for an assessment and further treatment. Case two is that of Joe, who was five years, seven months, and six days when he was assessed. He had to be assessed on two occasions it was difficult for him to do it on one, and you'll see why, because Joe's mom had a very uneventful and normal pregnancy, and Joe was born a term with no concerns. He reached all his milestones on time, but when he was nine months old, he was diagnosed with sickle cell anemia. He was treated medically, but his normal hemoglobin levels were only reached last year, when he was five year, four years old which meant that when he was at school, because they go to school when they are about three or four, he had difficulty sustaining a day at school because he would get pain and very, become very tired during the course of a day. This was his developmental profile on the Griffiths tree. And in this instance, you can see that his normal development is only found, or that which is better than normal, on his gross motor subscale. So once again, his strength is in his gross motor. There's consistency across the other four subscales. He will have 
challenges in his former school environment and would require monitoring and remedial attention. And he needs to be seen by a pediatrician, occupational therapist, and a psychologist. Universal, unique, same, same, but difference. And so we can see that the Griffith Scales is suitably set up to intervene, assess, and treat children who have developmental delays or disorders. And we are able to use this to pay particular attention to the new millennium goals, which are something we're focusing on right now, to help vulnerable infants and children around the world. And in fact, previous research studies using the Griffiths have tried to address some of these disorders. These are just some examples of the research done here at this university using the Griffith scales and having a look at children who might have presented with difficulties and disorders. So the big question is, can a measure that has been developed in the United Kingdom be used in other unique contexts like South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, China, India, because we know that there is an interplay between universal factors in child development and specific contexts. And the big question currently then is whether a measure such as the Griffiths III can really be used here. And there are encouraging signs in the literature that tell us actually using culturally appropriate standardized tests will really add value to researching these really key issues that we know impact our world today. Poverty, quality of education, and chronic disease, which we know really affect the way children develop and make them more and more vulnerable. So as a helping professional, the psychological assessment practitioner's core ethical responsibility can be summed up very specifically that nothing we do should harm our client. And that includes psychologically assessing children. Literature highlights the very important role that any kind of psychological test can play in a range of contexts, in research, in education, and in clinical practice, in organizations, and in medical and health settings. So what does this mean, in fact, for Africa then? Consider the Griffiths III. We know Africa as a continent is very diverse in its ethnic origin and cultural background. There are a large variety of languages, many religious and political orientations, clothing is different, gestures and attitudes change, and things towards the child and child rearing and family life are unique. Even the way in which formal education and levels of, levels of literacy are considered, there is a uniqueness, and yet there is a universal. So, to be able to assess the impact that such factors have on development, we can't just accept measures like the Griffiths III in the way that they are found to be. We cannot always go and develop an indigenous test for an indigenous community. What we can do, though, ethically and responsibly, is adapt the measures that we have. So while in the 20th century, Western and Europe-oriented tests have been largely used without adapting, standardizing, and norming them for a local context, the current trend is to take local psychometric properties and use them to adapt these other measures, which we know are robust and work. Currently, the Griffith scales have been researched and are being used in these countries in front of you on the slide in front of you. There's a large range of countries in front of you using the Griffith scales. And the question is, how have they adapted them? How do we adapt them? Because the Griffith scales give you valuable information, particularly diagnostic information that can be used right across the globe. So using the Griffith scales across these contexts would mean to adapt some of the tasks, try and translate the instructions, and find country-specific normative information, which is extremely important. Same, same, but different. So how do we go about then practically taking the Griffith III and adapting it 
for our African context. So here are a few suggestions. The first thing is that the test taker's world needs to be understood very well. So as a person testing a child in another context, immerse yourself in the lived world of the test taker. In immersing yourself in the world of the child, it means simply understanding them. It might mean having to draw a genogram, a community genogram, to actually understand what is going on, a visual depiction of what this child is living in and what their world is about. It means finding interesting ways to get informed consent. We always have to get the permission of a parent or a caregiver to test a child. So how do you get the permission of a parent whose home is in a rural part of the world and they need to go and work in a city far away? How do we get informed consent from that parent? It's important to think about these things. It's also important to make sure in developmental assessment that the child's chronological age is correctly estimated before you start. Many people of this world and our third world might not worry so much about age and how old a child is or when they were born, but we need to know that as de developmental assessors. So how do you find out if somebody doesn't really know which, which month of the year they were born in, when they were born? It would mean finding out facts like when was the child born. They might tell you it was when the youngest cow carved. That was when the child was born. It means finding out specifically in terms of historical evidence when this child might have been born and estimating it then based on collateral information. It also means understanding the physical status of the child, especially as we have HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, so many of these physical conditions in our world. It's also about understanding the value of the nutritional status of the child. Where there is no sanitation or water or hygiene, very often you have children with worm infestations. And a worm infestation that a child might be having will make it very difficult for them to pay attention to actually sustain concentration while you are testing them, that will make a difference. Even if the child is hungry, it's going to make a difference. They won't want to pay attention. It's important also to be aware of the concept of time. In a non-Western society, being ruled by the clock doesn't work. So that means that very often your tests where speed is important, there will be a problem if you don't take that into account. It also means allowing the child to practice their tasks over and over again, especially in our technologically sophisticated world. Teaching them if you're going to use an iPad or a tablet to do a task, how to actually do it, giving them a chance to practice. In developmental assessment, we often ask children to draw a person. Some children don't know what a pencil or a crayon is, so they do understand what mud is. It might be important enough to get them to draw a figure with a stick in wet sand or even make a person out of wet clay. In Africa, we are so lucky to have the richness of designs that can be found in beadwork. How about getting a child to do a block design using beads rather than blocks? Or using the beads to find out what the sequential memory may be like rather than a picture which is very Eurocentric or Western orientation. What about arithmetical problems or finding out what a child's numeracy levels are like? It might be important, instead of just getting them to count, to rather find out their numeracy ideas in terms of counting heads of cattle, oranges, beads or stones, or even cooking for a number of people or how many people are living in your house. Colour presents an interesting feature in our African world. In infants, yellow is the first colour that they see, recognise and are able to identify. But in our Isikosa culture, blue and green, for example, are interesting colours to talk about. So it might be important to try and understand the colour and what colour means to the child and perhaps even linking it to an object like blue as the sky or green as the grass 
rather than just using a colour like a yellow block, which might mean nothing to them. It's also very important that we look at the Griffiths tree as it's very holistic and has a huge number of items and might take very long to administer to develop a screening test of this measure, which would mean that a larger number of healthcare workers or educators could be trained to use. And in fact, not only trained to use the measure to help us assess children, but to adapt it. This is something which is growing in its urgency and need. Digitalization of test items and incorporating these innovative methods of assessment in, for example, tablet-based gamification and a storage approach really opens up a wide range of possibilities of testing to us. And even in a unique context like Africa, this innovative possibility is endless. And we would be remiss if we don't actually look into that. So as I come to the end of my lecture this evening, the conclusion that I have gained from hours of reflection and preparation of this lecture is that while I thought and had hoped that the Griffiths Three would become my greatest legacy, I now realize that my greatest legacy is in reality every life I have had or will have the privilege of touching. And to each one of you, I say tonight, your legacy too will be every life you touch. No matter how universal or unique the context may seem to be. In this room tonight, there are so many of you who I have had touch my life my family, my friends, the Faculty of Health Sciences, staff members and students, and particularly my home department, the psychology department, the Association for Research in Infant and Child Development, the Nelson Mandela University and all its staff members at large, and of course, my maker, for all he has done, I'm most grateful. I'd like to end with this quote. Most of our lives are a series of images. They pass us by like towns on a highway, but sometimes a moment stuns us as it happens, and we know that this instant is more than a fleeting image. We know that this moment, every part of it, will live on forever. Thank you.